Hi, everyone. This is Mike Wilkerson, founder of Stormwall Advisors and host of Stormwall.com. This is the Stormwall Advisors monthly update for January 2023. Thank you for being with me. Uh, we're a couple of days late here, had some technical issues, so actually re-recording uh, this message, assuming most people would want to get some audio along with the uh, along with the video. So welcome back. Um, wanted to do something a little different on this one and talk about uh, some some predictions, some expectations for possible events uh, for 2023. Recently written an article and had a number of uh, media conversations around these themes. And so why don't we jump right into it? I mean, just looking back on 2022, what a year full of surprises, uh, starting, of course, with Russia's invasion of Ukraine in uh, in February, the almost complete collapse of the crypto market uh, based on a number of events from uh, all time highs back in November of uh, last year of, of the year before 2021 to basically a down 90% plus in the wake of a number of frauds, collapses and other uh, messes that occurred during that time. Um, there are other things, probably one of the worst equity markets on record. Uh, and of course, um, the revelations of the Twitter files, which have come out in the last couple of months and say a lot about where we are right now. And then finally, uh, pretty persistent inflation driven by an energy crisis uh, related to, but not caused by uh, the war in Ukraine. We saw inflation coming a long time before that. So that year's behind us. What do we have to look forward to in 2023? So I start out somewhat controversially by arguing that inflation returns. That we have not seen the worst of it. That while we were getting some uh, some recovery and, and better prices uh, in the last couple of months, or at least slower rates of increase, that uh, we could see inflation as high as eight, ten, even twelve percent uh, at some point during 2023. I make this case, which I understand is the minority report. This is not the consensus view, but I make the case because the underlying conditions for inflation have not really changed. The fact that the U.S. money supply has tripled since uh, the global financial crisis 2009, the fact that we continue to run record deficits in our government, um, printing money, raising debt now at over $31 trillion, and uh, all of those conditions have not been addressed. Until they are, we're likely to see continued pricing pressure and what's called cost, cost push inflation in the labor markets remain quite tight. There's a lot of pressure on wages. We're seeing corporate margins compressing and, and other, other things. Now, the counterbalance to this is I also argue that in 2023, the U.S. economy enters into recession. Uh, we're seeing a lot of weakness in the underlying economy, seeing some warning signs from the housing market uh, where sales are slowing, home builder confidence is way down, new home starts are, are down, and uh, a number of other leading indicators saying 2023 is likely to see recession in the first half. Now, both of these things can be true, although they're usually not, so that is inflation and recession, but that's what stagflation is, is when you get rising inflation and rising unemployment, or uh, in other words, a recession, and something called the misery index. So I argue we could see a rise in the misery index of those two things happening at the same time in 2023. I also, third point that I make is that uh, I do not believe that the European energy crisis is over. While Europe has had a much more mild winter than was feared and expected and uh, supplies have held up, they were able to refill gas uh, uh, before winter set in. Similarly, the underlying conditions that led to the potential for crisis are still there. Namely, uh, that m many European countries went towards a um, green future uh, that was too, too much too soon reaching for a utopia that required them to abandon their actual strengths or traditional strengths in energy. Specifically, Germany abandoned its world-class coal and one of the cleanest coal industries in the world that was a source of a lot of their electrical power in exchange for Russian gas. And of course, now realizing the, the strategic folly that was made there are now trying to reverse course. Similarly, France, which has one of the best and most advanced nuclear power capabilities, nuclear power to electricity capabilities in the in Europe, for sure, if not in the world, also under policies of the former president, uh, Francois Hollande, uh, abandoned. And this summer, we saw real issues where of their 53 nuclear facilities, uh, at one point, half were out of commission for repairs, uh, maintenance, scheduled or otherwise damage or a part of the de uh, decommissioning program. Those conditions will not change and they will take some time, several years, 
to recover. And thus, I argue that the the issues around European energy are going to persist uh, unabated. I argue that, uh, therefore, oil, uh, gold, and commodities will perform uh, in the new year, that these conditions lead to an event where, as the dollar begins to weaken, oil remains strong for the reasons I've mentioned around, uh, around uh, energy. Number five, I argue that we are in this period of the rise of resource nationalism. So the way to think about this, and we can use Germany and Russia as an example, but also use the U.S. and what it discovered uh, during the pandemic years about the, the complications and impact of relying on China, a potential adversary, for its strategic uh, materials and strategic goods. It's not just been Germany who's realized that uh, relying on a potential adversary or enemy is a problem. The U.S. has realized it, and countries all over the world have seen this. The implication for this is that we are at the end of the age of globalization and we're returning to a period of nationalistic resource policies and energy and other, other periods. The U.S. is not doing it right now under the current Biden administration, but I think the, the underlying conditions are there to do it. And the effect of this is this won't be just America first, but it will manifest in France first, Japan first, each country taking its own view on its needs and finding alternative ways, safer ways to achieve it. With that, I argue number six, that traditional alliances break and new ones are being rebuilt. We've already seen some of that in the surprising shift in Saudi Arabia's stance away from its longtime ally and the United States uh, to uh you know, a direction away from us towards the alliance being built between China, or led by China, Russia, and others, uh, just as we're seeing the BRICS nations and uh, places like Turkey, India, et cetera, uh, make signs that they're, sh that they're moving into the camp, into the Russian uh, and Chinese alliance camp. I believe that trend, a multi-year trend, is going to continue. It's related to the first point around resource nationalism, but also related to the following point, which is I argue for number seven, that US dollar dominance is going to continue to erode. As these nations, Russia, China, and otherwise, have seen the extent to which the US continues to pursue uh, a policy of weaponizing the US dollar, in other words, blocking these countries off, using financial sanctions, excluding them from SWIFT payment networks and otherwise, all that has happened is increased the motivation and over time since the Crimea invasion, the capability of these nations to find sources uh, and, and means outside of the U.S. So you see it in the formation of the digital yuan, the central bank uh, digital coin that the Chinese government has issued. You see it in Russia's attempt to move the ruble to a gold and other commodity backed uh, currency. And is this the, the beginning of the end of the fiat regime? I argue uh, it may be so. Also a very long dated process. So think about those three things, resource nationalism, shifting global alliances, and a continued effort to move away from the US dollar by some of those same nations as three elements of the same facet of this dramatically changing geopolitical, geostrategic uh, world we find ourselves in today. Number eight, I argued that the West uh, will soon grow weary uh, of the costs and consequences of the Ukraine war and their involvement in it, and will begin to sue for peace. And that peace likely involves uh, Ukraine being promised a lot of things for rebuilding and reconstruction from the West, but at the same time having to make con uh, compromises and concessions around uh, geographies that are under Russian control today, uh, Russian speaking areas such as the Donbass, et cetera. Uh, and I just I'll clo to close out on that point, I, I do not, I continue to argue, as I said, in many uh, venues and writings, that I do not believe the narrative that we're getting on the Ukraine war is correct, that, that we are being fed misinformation about how the war is going, and it's going much worse on Ukraine than what we're hearing, uh, hearing overall. Next, I talked about something, something different, which is what I call the domino effect of exposure. And I mentioned at the, at the introduction, the Twitter files, how so much has come out in the last few months, things that were suspected, uh, what was originally called conspiracies or conspiracy theories, turns out to have quite a bit of substance. I'm talking about things like um, the US intelligence apparatus's uh, influence uh, and impact on the 2020 election, on uh, influence over Twitter and on other things, uh, silencing voices around uh, vac excuse me, vaccine effectiveness and adverse consequences and even the origin of the virus itself. And of course, the infamous uh, Hunter Biden lap laptop on a related issue. I make the argument 
that those the Twitter file revelations are actually the very first dominoes to fall. That as the House of Representatives changes hands uh, under Republican control, that there will be more hearings, there'll be more inquiries, and that we have not seen the worst of it yet. That has uh, implications, not just for politics, but for geopolitics and for the economy itself. So I think it's something to watch. I argue that we're in this age of discovery, this age of revolu revelation, of uncovering and unraveling of some of these issues that uh, that have that have been uh, in our uh, affecting our country. All right, moving on quickly. China number ten. China barks but does not bite at Taiwan. Um, I would I argue that we're going to see continued pressure from China uh, on Taiwan, intimidations, threats, uh, naval and military actions that transgress a number of existing norms and boundaries. Uh, and that is, of course, intended to keep the, the leash very short, to keep the pressure up. But I do not believe that China will is as foolhardy as to take the move of an actual invasion this year. While you could argue that they'd be better off doing so under the Biden administration and under uh, a president like Trump, um, nonetheless, we have to keep in mind that the U.S. remains China's most important trading partner. To disrupt that you know, through sanctions, blockades, or whatever means might occur uh, is self-defeating for China, and they're not in a position to uh, be able to, to do that in light of their own weakness in their own economy, social unrest, et cetera. So I think they continue to, uh, to, to put the pressure on, but not actually take action. Oh, some good news, number 11, and we're getting to the end here, is I do argue that we will see, even with recession in the first half, uh, by the second half of 2023, uh, signs of, of rebound, of recovery in the economy. One of the great things that uh, I realize as I look at the history of the United States is part of my work on my book, Why America Matters, is just the resilience uh, and de depth and breadth of the U.S. economy, that uh, with the exception of the Great Depression, that uh, oh, remarkably, the U.S. has recovered quickly under almost uh, every uh, situation we faced. Well, this recession that is coming may hopefully not be nearly that bad, um, a lot of it is based on uh, issues that have been building for quite some time, but the U.S. Uh, markets are resilient and we should be able to bounce back quickly. I then say, however, number 12, uh, if we get more of the same, that may not be true. More of the same, meaning the continuation of regulatory inter interference, red tape bureaucracy, uh, blocking our, um, our own U.S. energy indus industry, making it impossible for development and especially increasing refining capacity. And of course, the recklessness that's going on at the Southern border, these, these issues may uh, may delay that recovery and, uh, and may impact it. So that's it. You can find this article on stormwall.com uh, and more, more detail around it. You can also find it at the Epic Times uh, where the article first appeared. If you've enjoyed this, uh, share it, like it. Uh, if you've seen it on the website, wonderful. Sign up for emails uh, and more information. If you're catching this on YouTube, uh, again, subscribe, share, and uh, subscribe to my YouTube uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel. Wishing everyone the very best for Happy New Year, and we'll speak to you soon.